Hi, everybody. It's Rory Cowan here from Mrs. Brown's Boys, and I'm talking to Chris Gordon on Hellblazer Braves. Hope you like it. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you may be in the world right now. Welcome to Hellblazer Beers, part of the BSPN Podcast Network, with your host as ever, moi, Chris Gordon. Today's guest on episode 74. Seven, 74? I've done 74 of these already. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Thank you so much. Whoa. Note to self, got to do something special for the 100th episode for everybody. Ha <laughs> ha. 100. 74, 74, sorry, sorry, I digress, I digress, sorry, my guest, where was I, oh yes, my guest for this episode is known to millions as part of a comedy ensemble who sell out theatres and arenas alike when they take their show live, and they have TV viewers, millions of TV viewers, howling with laughter when they do their TV show and when it's on BBC, no further introductions needed, I am so proud to introduce to you tonight, Rory Cowan, of Mrs. Brown's Boys. So good evening everyone. As you can see, I am here with the delightful Rory Cowan from Mrs. Brown's Boys. Hi hi. Hello everybody. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. Hi you, Chris. Hi. Hi hi. <laughs> I'll do that. Hey campers. I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh yes. Uh, since then <laughs> <laughs> it was a brilliant show that i loved that show yeah. fantastic um yeah so thank you very much for being here and appreciate you uh accepting i did bug you the night you came out i tweeted to you obviously when we came to see you in real i was there tweeted right. to you. Uh, Bill, i loved i loved that show that was fabulous because it's gone back to a theater um since yeah. we've been on television in 2011 it's been all arenas that we do and I've missed the theatres. There's a difference. Now, the arenas are brilliant. Don't get me wrong. I love the arenas. They're much yeah. bigger, more people. The laughter is louder. But I still love it. I still love a theatre. So going to Rail was great. It is. It's, it's always great to see. You get such a lovely yeah. reception there as well. And... The audience are right in front of you. You can see yeah. them. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. Because you, you... So you can, I can hear them. I'm blind as a bat, so I don't see them. All. We come out <laughs> to take the bell. Yeah. <laughs> there. Ah, oh, that, 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 that's handy to know. So when we're sat in the back, I'm thinking, oh, this, they can see us. No, you can't. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a very raucous crowd, I think. And it's a, yeah, it was a really, especially this year, it was very receptive as well. I mean, this is it wonderful, was, wonderful. It's always sold out. But yeah, I can see the arenas. The arenas are packed as well. You oh, know, there are Manchester like and Glasgow. And there's big screens on either side. It's like a rock gig. <laughs> um, and I love it. It's fantastic. It's just the way we've worked. We worked it the way you would expect people to. Um, it's the way it should be done. And even though there's quicker ways now, mm-hmm. you can get to the into the charts or you can become famous very quickly. We started off at Mrs. Brown's Boys with Brent. I started working with Brendan O'Carroll 27 years ago, and we were doing pubs. And the first gig we ever did in England, I now not Scotland, but Scotland, the, we started in the pavilion. But in England, the first gig we ever had was in Liverpool. And it was in the Neptune Theatre, which is now the Brian Epstein Theatre, and that held about 300 people. Yeah. Then we went to the Royal Court in Liverpool, and that had 1,500 people. Then we went to the Empire, which had 3,000, and now we're in the Echo Arena. But we've done it. We've built and built and built and built. Mm-hmm. And, built. and that's the way. I, I love that we did it that way. It didn't just happen uh, yeah. after television. Like A lot of people south of Birmingham don't realise that um, we had a great career. We had a wonderful career in England. Um, they think that we started on television in 2011, south mm. of Birmingham. But the truth is, south of Birmingham, until 2011, you couldn't give us away free with a packet of dad. <laughs> but we had a good career. We were doing very well. Birmingham and north, into North England into Scotland, we were doing great. Yeah. Um, so it's one of the... I, I just think the way we did it was, was fantastic. Brilliant. I mean, can you? Happened, but that's how it happened. Yeah, I know. I was gonna, that's, that was the first question. I anyway, preempted. <laughs> but that's what, I, know, I do know because you started out as a record shop manager as well, and then obviously went to to be Brendan's publicist. And well, then... when I started working, um, my mother. Now, this is a true story. Uh, I was brilliant at maths in school. Absolutely fantastic. I am. Um, maths came very easy to me, and working out solutions came very easily easy to me. It still does. But I 
no interest in maths. And my mother kept saying, oh, you'll get a job in the bank, you'll get a job in the bank. And she yeah. kept going on about getting a job in the bank. And I couldn't think of anything I would hate more. <laughs> so when I went in at, to do my final exams, I don't know what it's called in the UK, maybe it's the GCSEs or something. It's, it's an exam you take when you're 17 or 18, when you're right. leaving school. A-levels, I think they're over here, yeah. Whatever it is. And I deliberately failed maths. Right. Um, um, I went in, deliberately failed it. So was, there was my mother is like Mrs. Brown. She will <laughs> nag you into doing what you, she wants you to do. Mm-hmm. So I deliberately failed maths, and I got a job in a record shop. And it was owned. It was the record shop was owned by one of the major record companies at the time, EMI. Mm-hmm. They had the Beatles and Paul McCartney and uh, Dave, uh, Diana Ross, every, everybody, yeah. loads of people, and um, one of the top five music companies in the world. I, within seven years of working in that record shop, I was the marketing manager of the company, and I was working with people like Paul McCartney and Tina wow. Turner, and David Bowie, and all. I worked like I've, I'm Queen. I I I, I worked with them all as the marketing manager of EMI yeah. in Ireland. So I just it just proves to me that if you are if you are passionate about something and you would do something that you would you get paid for doing something you would you would do anyway. Like yeah. for me playing records I would have done that for nothing and when I started in EMI I was getting £21.50 a week so I was getting paid to do what I would have done for nothing Mm -hmm. and you'll always get ahead if you work at a job that you're really passionate about in something you're passionate about you will people will notice and that's the way it happened with me and then after I was made redundant I well I had seen Brendan O'Carroll while I was in EMI and I booked him to do a gig and that's how it started Mm -hmm. 1991 and I haven't looked back. I tell you, it was the best day of my life meeting that man. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Like you say, you've not looked back. Look at the, you know. <laughs> and it's a great way to build it up, you know, like you have done and you've gone out and you've worked hard because yeah. there are those and I, I won't knock all of them. Um, I'm jealous of them, obviously, because here I am <laughs> trying to do a passion, you know, but they, they just go out and suddenly, all of a sudden, overnight, they're whomph successes. Yeah, but uh, they're but, gone, they, but they, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah, exactly. They go I'm just not, as quick. They have no grounding in it. Um, we started off just doing pubs Brendan was doing pubs and we are uh, one one year in Dublin in Ireland we did uh, th- over 310 gigs mm. in 365 days Brendan used to do eight gigs a week he used to do a Sunday morning in one pub and a Sunday night in another pub and then he'd work Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday and Saturday as well so he used to do eight gigs oh and that's how we started and we used to travel the, the person, the promoter we had at the time, I swear he used to just throw a dartboard at the map of Ireland because we could be up in the northeast mm-hmm. or the northwest in Mayo and the next day we could be down in the southeast and then the next day we could be back up in the northwest again. So we were constantly travelling up and down. There was no sort of routine around, like, you know, if you play Liverpool, then you play yeah. Manchester, then you play Birmingham and yeah. you go on from one place to the next. We were all over the country, but we did it and we had a great time. And we still have a great time, and that's why we appreciate what we have now, mm-hmm. um, because we've gone through that. We've put the spade work in back then, yeah. and we've we've never stopped. And the thing is, we could go back to doing that, and if it ever, if it was ever necessary to do that, we could do that no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but some other bands, they are not bands, but bands, comedians, television presenters, whatever, when they start big. They have no background to fall back on when things go quiet or when things aren't as successful as that. And they, they just yeah, they just they fizzle them. out again. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it doesn't go and happen to us. Because there you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're like sparklers. They've got a big bang and then they just fizzle out. <laughs> that's, that's it. Blow out very, very quickly. They oh, burn, they shine bright, but then they burn out fast. Exactly, exactly. And that's great. And it's, you know, it's good to see that. Style what? So I was going to say the Beatles could have written the eight days a week after Brendan, then you know the eight gigs a week. <laughs> the Beatles, even they're, I, uh, they're a brilliant example of what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. They went to Hamburg before they were even signed to EMI in 1962, and they worked there for solidly for almost three years, and they were doing shows uh, every night, seven nights a week, and they would do eight hours, mm-hmm. nine hours, ten hours a night playing. Yeah. So by the time the record company found them. They were the best live band in the world. Mm-hmm. They were absolutely brilliant because they put the work in, and you've you've got to do that. That's the that's the thing. Well, that's the way I think anyway, because that will enable you to have a long career. No, no, definitely, I, don't, I totally agree with you, and you, you've got to have the passion to do that as well, because there are the, you the times you get knocked back, and I can imagine. 
I mean, it looks great. We're on arenas and stuff like that. But to get there, it's hard work. Exactly. And that's the other joke. Like, how do you get to Madison Square Garden? Somebody goes to America. How do you get to Madison Square Gardens? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> and that's what it is. You've got to put the hard... You've got to put the work in. Oh, you do. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I'm finding that, you know... Um, don't mean to drag this about me, but it's about with this show that I've done. I mean, I started off 18 months ago, and it is. It's I'm trying to build myself up and trying to get there, but it's building up. And I mean, I don't get paid for this, so this is all. I work 12, what eight hours a day. I travel in three hours each way, and I come home because I love this. I love talking to people like you, and I love being able to spit like you. The fans send me questions and stuff, and I, it's that interaction. Well, it will build up because that enthusiasm will come across in what you're doing. Um, and I don't give up because, I mean, just keep looking at the next hurdle and get over that and then it's the next hurdle and the next hurdle and baby steps and you will get to where you, you will, it will work out for you if oh, you're yeah, enthusiastic definitely. about it. Exactly. It'll be a few years. I've actually got a publicist in LA now. She's a friend of mine I, I talk to and she's helping me and it's like... That's, that's, <laughs> it, that's it. That's it. Oh, you're, you've arrived already. <laughs> well, she's not my publicist but she's a, she's a friend who is a <laughs> she'll help you <laughs> oh she has done she's done she's she's absolutely fantastic fabulous rebranding excellent is it uh, when you were younger i mean obviously going into math you loved your maths and stuff when you were younger would you have ever dreamed that you'd be doing what you're doing now no because i had no interest in ever going on the stage i was in school plays and activity mm. plays and stuff like that but that was just a laugh it wasn't anything that i had a uh, a, pa- a vocation to do or anything I had an ambition to do like Jenny Brendan's wife and yeah. who plays Kathy, she always wanted to be an actress she always did mm-hmm. and she had other jobs and stuff like that but she was acting in her spare time as well she always wanted to be an actress I never had that I really never had it um, my interest was always music and playing records and I loved vinyl and looking at reading everything out and who was producing what and who played yeah. on what and it was all all this type of stuff and I adored, I loved it. And then when I was in EMI, uh, when I was the marketing manager and I was working with all these other big artists, mm-hmm. I used to watch how they worked and I used to ask them how they worked. And I remember Blackie Lawless from Wasp, he always said to me, he said to me the first time, how long is the interview? And I'd say, well, this one is 10 minutes. And how long is the next one? And he'd say 20 minutes. And how long is this one? I'd say an hour. And I said to him, listen, you're here for the day. Why do you keep asking how long is the interview? Yeah. And he said, I need to know. So if it's 10 minutes, I've got, say, six or seven messages to get through. Mm -hmm. So if it's 10 minutes, I'll go bang, 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 bang. We're going to be here. We're going, the new single is this. The new album is coming out, such and such a date. I'll go bang, 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 bang. So as nobody can say, well, thanks very much, Blackie, and I've left a load of messages that I haven't had a chance to do. If it's an hour long, he says, I can space them out. And I started to realize, this is how you do that. So I was watching everybody, and... When I went on the stage in Mrs. Brown's Voice, when Brendan said to me, an actor left, and Brendan said, right, you're on tonight, you know the lines. All I could think of about acting and going on stage was something Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden said to me when I was in EMI. <laughs> right. Dickinson, I lo- he's a brilliant singer, he's fabulous, mm-hmm. and he's a lovely guy. If he wants to, he can blend in with the wallpaper. and you would- <laughs> He could walk down the street, you wouldn't know it was him. You wouldn't know this is the guy from Iron Maiden. Yeah. Um, the, one of the biggest metal bands ever mm-hmm. you, you, you wouldn't see him you wouldn't notice him if he decides when he's going on stage the hair was at the time he'd long hair so that was shooshed up and he had the, the leather jackets on with the silver or black leather jacket, silver on them and all this type of stuff and I said to him you look so different on stage than you do off stage yeah. and I was questioning him on how he picked his costumes and what made why he would pick certain costumes as mm-hmm. regards to, uh, as opposed to other things and he said I want to get seen from the back of the auditorium and when he would go on stage you would you couldn't take your eyes off him he was yeah. a magnificent performer he's like Mick Jagger um, couldn't, you can't take your eyes off Mick Jagger and Freddie Mercury you couldn't take your eyes off oh, him God, they no. were front men mm-hmm. and Bruce Dickinson for Iron Maiden is the same he's a brilliant front man for a band and he was all over the stage but you couldn't take your eyes off him off stage you'd pass him by you wouldn't even notice him Yeah. when Brendan said when we were in Liverpool in the Royal Court and he said, you're on tomorrow night. I decided, oh, what am I going to do? And then the only thing I could think of was, how am I going to get notes from the back of <laughs> the venue? So I went out and I bleached my hair blonde and I got yellow shirts and pink shirts and red shirts. And that was it. So I walked on the stage and it was like, I just thought, well, I'm going to be seen at the back. And that's all I knew. Mm-hmm. That's 
that's the only thing that I that I ever did. So you take these things out of your background, and as long as you want to keep learning about stuff, and it works yeah. for me, because now I'm one of the most recognisable characters in Mrs. Brown's Boys. Um, like Brendan is the star of the show, and Brendan and it's fabulous for Brendan in Ireland. Everyone knows him. Mm-hmm. UK, they might know, they know him as Mrs. Brown, and a lot of people might know him as Brendan, but not as much as they do in Ireland. Like yeah. they know Mrs. Brown more, mm-hmm. and in America, he's known as an author because of the books he's written. Yeah. They don't know him as Mrs. Brown. They don't know him as Brendan, and he lives in Florida, and he can walk around, and nobody knows him. <laughs> I don't get that because I walk around in the UK or Ireland, and everybody knows me. <laughs> Bleach me yeah. hair, wear the bright clothes, and do all this type of stuff, and that's what I did. But it's fabulous. <laughs> it is. That is fantastic. Mm. It's a great story. I mean, there's a couple of ways. So I actually met Robert Plant, and when he said about Bruce Dickinson, I bumped into Robert Plant, and it's the most embarrassing story of my life because he was in a petrol station in Mid Wales, where I went to university, yeah. and I just didn't have a clue who he was. My friend who was sat in the car, who found out afterwards, was a huge rock fan, and he was, he basically almost throttled me when I said, it's "Just greasy biker." That's he just he looked so yeah, just like jeans ripped t-shirt. What they do it's the, they they do this and they get on. I always thought a great sketch, a great comedy sketch, would be like that for Daniel O'Donnell. Um, and I must say to him next time I see him because I he, I know him. Um, but I must say to him, I always thought a great comedy sketch would him be turning up to a gig in ripped jeans and t-shirts and and hair all over the place, and then he's in the in the changing room, and you only you don't see him going in, you don't know who it is, yeah. and then he puts himself up and comes out on the stage as Daniel O'Donnell. <laughs> I just think it would be brilliant because. So many of them, you don't know what they, they are not like what they are on stage. On stage, mm-hmm. it's a performance and they this is what they do. And you recognize them on stage. But off stage, you won't, you won't recognize them. Um, I, 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 I went the other way. I wanted to be recognized yeah. and that's the way it was. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Fair enough. I actually did wrestling a couple of years ago myself. Um, you know, the proper, you know, the American style wrestling. I've got into okay. it. Age, age, uh, age thirty-eight, I started getting into it, and uh, but I was trying to get my character over. And I will say, because I, the wrestling managers, they said for some reason they said that I was the campest person they've ever met. Because I'd quite happily, I'd be dancing and you know everything with the music coming on and jigging. And they said, why don't you make that your gimmick? So I did, and ended up with like blue and white zebra lycra. <laughs> And the character came out, and it was flamboyant, it was camp. They turned around, they said I was the promo king, because it was like, ooh, I'll take you in the ring, baby. You know, it was really that kind of you know, that is double what, entendre that is and stuff. You put, on a, you put on a show, and that's it. The only thing is, though, when you get into that, it's hard, it's hard to get back out of it again. <laughs> yeah. If you were still in wrestling, you would, have, you, you would not be able to... Like, I'm, everyone sees me as Rory Brown and stuff like that. If I was to go back to my natural colour, whatever it is now, probably grey, it was brown when I got it, when I started bleaching at first, that wouldn't, the fans would not like that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? They, they, they like Rory Brown the way he is. Yeah. And so I can't change that now. So, But I don't care. I love it. It's, <laughs> uh, it's fabulous. It is, it is a great character. Yeah. To be. I gave up wrestling. I, I had an accident and... Tore a link, tore a Muslim, a quad Muslim, my leg. Put, oh put, put pay to that. So, <laughs> my, my, my wife was. So everything happens for a reason. It does, it does. And yeah, I stopped wrestling and started doing this. And look where. <laughs> exactly. I'm sitting here talking to Rory Cowan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be talking to you. This is fabulous. <laughs> cool. Can I, thank you. <laughs> Who inspired you when you were younger? As in, what kind of inspirations did you have getting up? My in the sixties, um, I loved. Uh, I I always loved music, but in the sixties, I liked so- Sandy Shaw was the mm-hmm. first singer that I became a fan of, um, and I loved her. But my hero, my big hero, and my idol, and there was the idol of all idols was Mark Boland. There was never anybody else to touch him. Now I used yeah. to love Slade, and I do. I still love Slade. And now Noddy Holder comes to our shows, and he's a friend of mine, uh-huh. and I know. And I loved, I was a big fan of Slade, but Mark Boland was, the time I saw him on Top of the Pops, the mm-hmm. first time I saw him on Top of the Pops, I can only describe it as being when pop rock music went from black and white into colour. Yeah. It was just, it had that unbelievable effect on me, that I was gone, I was I was gone. I wanted to be like Mark Boland. I thought Mark Boland was the only thing to aspire to. And I used to have long hair because everyone did in the early 70s. And I'd hair, or mid 70s, I had hair down to my elbows, but it was dead straight. And I wanted to be, I wanted corkscrew curls like Mark Bowles. <laughs> 
And a friend of mine worked in a hairdresser's, but he had only got the job six months or six weeks beforehand. But yeah. as far as I was concerned, he works in a hairdresser, he's an expert on hair. But he was only the sweeper upper at the time. <laughs> he served in an apprenticeship. And I said, I want cork, corkscrew curls. And he said to me, what you need to do, he says, is get your mother's rollers and put them in at night. Now, my mother had these big, thick, pink foam, if you remember right, that. Yeah, thing. yeah. <laughs> curler rollers mm -hmm. with a white bar that went around the front and another thing that came over and clipped them on they were big chunky things he says put them in as tight as you can spray loads of hair lacquer on it put a hair net over it and wear then wear go to bed so of course i did all that i yeah. did that and the next day and he had said to me leave it in as long as possible i went to school mm -hmm. with my hair in rollers and the hair net didn't think anything of it it was the 70s i'd be duffel coat hold up <laughs> yeah and I got into school and in the bathroom, in the, in the toilets in the school, I took the rollers out and my hair went like an old lady set. It just went like that. <laughs> like Hyacinth Bouquet or something. Do you know, what I mean? you know that type of thing? I know what you mean, yeah. I can still see that I'm looking in the mirror and I can still feel the shock. And I'm going, what went wrong? How did this not work out? <laughs> <laughs> I used to do anything to look like Mark Boland, even making a total fool of myself, because at, mm -hmm. at that time I had to go into the class. So I ran my head under the tap to try and straighten <laughs> my hair out. Yeah. But it started, as it dried, it started going back. <laughs> so I had to open my collar and pull the hair down and push it in all around. I then try and close the collar like this. And they wouldn't let me go home. And I was pretending to be sick. I was doing everything. And all the classmates were saying, what's wrong with your hair? Because they'd see a curl going. In. <laughs> and that's what I did. Every, and Mark Boland had that effect and God love him he's 40 years dead this year and I was I remember the day he died and I was devastated I was absolutely devastated I think I went into mourning for about six months when he died he yeah. had that much of an effect on me Mark Boland was just the be all and end all as far as I was concerned Fair enough. he was a master and a completely unique take on everything that was out at the time was, ah, music was unbelievable yeah. <laughs> even today now his music still carries today quite, oh, quite easily good people afterwards that I was huge fans of when I was in school like Queen and stuff like that I mm. was a massive Queen fan and then when I was in EMI when they came over to Ireland and I'm dealing with like setting up interviews for Brian May and stuff like that and I'm sitting in backstage with Freddie Mercury and I go it's it was a big thing mm -hmm. but if Mark Boland had been alive and he'd came in I would have just passed <laughs> peacefully I really would have because he was Everybody else I was a fan of, and Kate Bush I knew quite well when I worked wow. in the MI, and I loved her. I absolutely mm. adored everything Kate Bush did. Um, but at the same time, there was nothing compared to Mark Boland. He was yep. just, he was the idol of all idols for me. Because I was at that time. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean, my dad had a huge crush on Kate Bush. What was Freddie like? He She's was gorgeous. <laughs> Kate Bush was one of Freddie Mercury was hilarious. He was a he was a very he was a camp funny man. He mm -hmm. was really, really funny. Um John Deacon from Queen is a yep. brilliant dancer. You'd never guess it. Really? We, yeah, we went to a night we went to nightclubs and he would be the, always up on the floor dancing. An amazing dancer. Um absolutely brilliant. Uh they the, they were lovely and Kate Bush was absolutely gorgeous. Um Weird in mm. a, in a nice way, but I remember when Wuthering Heights came out. I was working in the record shop that EMI had, yeah, and I'd seen her on top of the pops. But whatever had happened, I didn't. I wasn't sure about the song. So when the single came into the record shop, I put it on first thing in the morning, and I just thought Wuthering Heights. This was absolutely brilliant, and I played that song nonstop that day until six o'clock that evening when I closed mm. the record. I remember that. Like all my memories are related to music, yeah, or if the Thing happened there's a piece of music that was relevant of at that time and in all my memories music and people say that to me all the time every time you talk about something in your background music always comes into it i loved i was 21 pounds 50 a week working in a record shop it was the best job i ever had in my life i loved it i yeah. absolutely adored it well that's like you said if you find that kind of a job where you you, yeah. you're happy doing whatever you want to do then you know, always that's... Get, you'll always get moved ahead like I always said like if I was a road sweeper mm -hmm. I would try to be the best road sweeper in the world Yeah, because I would be noticed and I know that within a week or a month I wouldn't be a road sweeper forever somebody would say that guy's doing alright we'd promote him to looking after these road sweepers and then you get promoted again mm -hmm. always if you if you do whatever you're doing I just can't understand people who go to work and don't they're just filling the time and they're just doing it to get paid yeah. that look, because they're going to stay in that rut. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes you do need a bit of luck. You really do. And you do need to get noticed and stuff like that. But you can also make your own look. 
Um, I just can't. I've never had a job that uh, I didn't like going to work. I didn't like getting up to go to work to do. Yeah. Um, I'm 57 now, and I, I just think I'm incredibly lucky that everything I've ever done work-wise mm-hmm. has been something I really wanted to do. So there you cool. go. It's fantastic. You say you'd be work. the best road sweeper in the world as well. Would you? Uh, would that be the old? Uh, you've had seven. Brilliant! If you kept the broom for like eleven years, but you've had seven new handles and five new brushes, no tr- would, trigger wise. <laughs> I would try to be the best. If you're going to do something, you have to try and be the best. And if you do it, you'll be no the the you will be it will be noticed what you're doing. Oh, it will yeah. be noticed, and you will get moved. You will get promoted. Things will happen. Exactly. So exactly. Just, if you just go and just sweep, and you're just the. Uh, You'd be left doing it, do you know what I mean? Put the put spade work in, you'd be grand. Exactly, exactly. It's, uh, it's getting no- like you say, getting noticed, but doing something to get yourself noticed. No, yeah, you will. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of advice would you give your younger self now? The advice I would give my younger self is, um, I look back, when I was in school and I left school, I didn't come out till I was 24, I my the advice I would give to my younger self is um, I should have been myself. Mm-hmm. I would say this to everybody: if you're gay, straight, whatever it is, be yourself. Admit it as soon as you can. I know sometimes it might be difficult, but even admit it to yourself. Yeah, don't try and hide it. I used to work with girls and all this type of stuff, and then I realized that the girls they're only going to be my friends. There's never going to be a long term relationship this, mm-hmm. this way. But I I kept up that because I thought. That if at the time I thought that if I come out, if I say it to my friends and they don't like it, I've no friends left. Yeah. So, but when I did decide to come out and tell them when I was 24 or 25 or whatever age it was, none of them cared. None of them cared. And my two best friends that I've known when I met, when I went on the gay scene first, Ken and Robert, they're still my two best friends now. Um, and I knew, like, and we're going back. Oh, 33, 34 years now since, and they're my best friends still. That's very cool. So, I, if my advice would be, there is a community out there, if you're gay or whatever, and there, there is a community out there willing to welcome you. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is go and find them. They won't find you, but you go and find them, and you will be welcomed, and you'll meet brilliant friends. You will have the best time, and you will have lovely, lovely friends. And the straight friends that you have that you grew up with, they're not going to care. They really won't. And your mother and your father mm-hmm. won't care. They really won't. The chances of them care, of being upset about it are slim to none. Yeah. And it's just this, I can get where they're coming from. It's hard because I was myself. When you're younger, you don't want to be different to everybody else. You want to be the same. Mm-hmm. So you think you're different, but you want to have the same music, same clothes, same hairstyle, same gig, same football teams you support, same everything. You that's important as a teenager. You don't want to be that different. You don't want to be radically different, like gay when everybody else is straight. Maybe it's changed now. I don't know. But my advice to my younger self was: I should have came out when I was fourteen or fifteen. I should have just done it because um, I wasted a lot of years. I wasted about ten years worrying. Mm-hmm something I didn't need to worry about none of my friends cared less yeah not I had no problems none of them cared less I've had and I know I hear gay people saying oh they were bullied and they were all I must have had a charmed life it never happened to me. but then again I never came <laughs> I had no problems with anybody no everybody was delighted and it was like they were ringing other people to say guess what the news is Rory is gay it was <laughs> they thought this was something to be celebrated yeah. and tell everybody about it and mm-hmm. I wasted an awful lot of time worrying or I should have just trusted they were my friends. I should have trusted that they would still be my friends afterwards. Yeah. But there you go. <laughs> cool. I found there's a few of my friends at university. They they came out at uni as well because it was a climate mm. where they suddenly felt comfortable because they yeah. knew that the rest of us just really didn't give a rat's ass what you were, you know, who you were, where, kind of where you're coming from. Friends. If people had a problem with you in the first place, they would use you being gay as the, as the excuse. Exactly. After, after come out. So you're still going to have a problem with those people, whether you were came out or you didn't come out. Yeah. But your friends, they will not have a problem with you whatsoever, based on my experience, I can say that. Mm-hmm. And um, I used to get women that I wouldn't have had, to, even when they told I was straight, I wouldn't have had a chance with. But they were all ringing me up thinking, oh, maybe he just needs a good woman to sort himself out. And I'm going, oh, God's sake. <laughs> 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 but I, that's the thing. Just be yourself. If you're, like, especially if you're gay, 
there's a there's a fabulous community out there of people in every city in town. May, well, mainly mainly cities. There's a there's a gay community in every city, and they are very welcoming to new people that come onto the scene. Yeah. And you'll make brilliant friends there, and you'll make because I did. I know I did. Mm-hmm. My two best friends, Ken and Robert, they've been friends of mine for over thirty years now. Yeah, I mean that is fantastic. I mean, I I the, and them if I hadn't been gay, I'd never have met them. Yeah, think of God, think of that bloody hell. I'm glad <laughs> I am because they're the best friends I could hope for. Well, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Fair enough. And thirty years yeah. is a good friendship to have. Like yeah. I said, I've still got friends from university from that who we made friends with twenty years. ago. Yeah, that's twenty. Oh God, that's twenty. Yeah, third, yeah. I'm old now, Roy. You see, I'm so <laughs> 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 that's, that's just making. Yeah, exactly. I'm just making me feel old there. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, um, I've I've moved on to one general one before moving on to like Mrs. Brown's because I know time's shooting. Is you've ha- dealt with a lot of crap online. I noticed that you you do have a fantastic way. I, I don't want to go too much into what it's, yeah. you, you do have a fantastic way of putting them down which is brilliant and putting trolls down because i've seen twitter is it you've got you've got used to it what twitter can be a very nasty place and people like see because everyone has a voice everyone can say something and Uh on twitter they can say they can be as angry as they like but they're not really angry people they just come across as that so i don't like would like I say to people, they, 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 they might be angry over, like really angry over a television show, Mrs. Brown's Boys, they don't like it, and they go to extremes not liking it. Oh, and I just said to them, oh, come on, I said, have you spent too, are you working with glue too much? Something <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's, and I did try and say, listen, it's only a television show. Mm-hmm. When you look at what's happening in Syria, Westminster Bridge, Stockholm, what are you getting angry over a television show for? Switch the channels. These days, it's not like there's one or two channels. There's hundreds of the things. Every Everybody has yep. loads of channels. You don't need to watch something. But there's people that will sit down and watch Mrs. Brown's Boys just to not like it and then go to complete extremes of how much they hate it and how... <laughs> and I love I love those people on Twitter because I just have great fun with them. Yeah. And then the, they calm down a bit afterwards when they realise, come on, it's only a television programme. Yeah. If you're going to be angry, be angry at this, what's going on in the world, like mm-hmm. Westminster Bridge and Syria and stuff like that. Be angry about that. That's yeah. something mm-hmm. we should all be angry about. Mm-hmm. Don't be angry over a television programme. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it- a and that's what I try to get across how absurd the whole thing is exactly Um, exactly (laughs) I mean I've seen quite a few things as well from other other shows I mean there's one do you know the show Lucifer no uh, it's one which is obviously as is the title it's Lucifer but Lucifer Lucifer leaves hell goes on vacation and comes to LA and it's it's Tom Ellis um, you know the wonderful Tom Ellis he's brilliant in it and but they were obviously discussing all the background stories and someone's there going, for God's sake, stop bringing bloody religion into it. And they're really ranting. And it's like, but it's, it, it, it really, down. calm down. It's well, a TV show. Yeah. <laughs> and TV, if you're scheduling TV, it's like if a record company has a load of artists, they will try and appeal to every, have a show to appeal, like they'll have something like Floggers to appeal to the older people or whatever, or the women at home, the the, the, the women at home in the afternoon, yeah. or they'll have cookery programs, or they'll have loose women, and then they, in the evenings they'll have news things, and then they'll have an entertainment program, mm-hmm. they'll have sport, and they'll have, they will try to have, to schedule that not every program is the same, yeah. and have different programs, and hopefully over the day or the week they will appeal to they will have something that appeals to everybody, mm-hmm. something on the show. You can't appeal, with a comedy show, you can't appeal to everybody. Well, no, it's and, a certain taste, you know. That's... Like Lucifer, I don't know that show, but it's not going to appeal to everybody, but it's going to appeal to somebody. Mm-hmm. And don't respect the audience for that show or for a comedy show just because it's not your type of, just, if, if you don't like it, just switch off. Exactly. And doing that, it's a simple thing to do. Why would you get upset over a television program? Totally, <laughs> totally agree. Because you've, you've got remote control. Well, Flick. Yeah, yeah, but if you were sitting down talking with those people, they would probably sound rational. They'd say, "Oh, it's not my type of show." Blah blah blah. Yeah. But because it's Twitter, they yeah. can rant and they and they do and they they have to be extreme. And you just go, "Ah, oh, no, come on." Yeah. <laughs> really like him, just come back, come yeah. back a bit. They sit and put their. Yeah. Do. I have great fun doing. Oh, yeah. They sit and put I, their ammo belts on and get their machine keyboard warriors, and they're all ready. <laughs> oh yeah, they are. But there's a lot of there's things you should be angry about. Not a television show. That's not one of them. <laughs> no, no, you're right. There's there's too much crap going on in this world to uh, to worry about a TV show and 
take, exactly. take it. Exactly. Uh, How would you get rid of a TV show? It just, it, it <laughs> defies all logic to me as far as I'm concerned. It does, it does. I don't think they're right about Mrs. Brown's Boys, by the way, because this is this is a brilliant show. <laughs> you see, at the fact, that, like, uh, the, if people are having reactions like that, it means that it is affecting them in some way. Like, I mean, we used to get it with critics here in Ireland, and mm. now the critics are starting to come around. Some of them, they are starting to come around, and I'm thinking it's because their mothers are looking at it, and the mothers are laughing, and the critics are going, "Well, if me mammy likes it, it must be all right." And they've changed. They yeah. used to give it about the language, and you're going. Do you ever step outside your front door? You're hearing this all over. And Mrs. Brown never knows she's using bad language. She mm. never, ever knows it. And you see it in the plays and on television when somebody uses it. And she'll say, don't you use that effing word. Don't you use that effing language in front of granddad. Yeah. Mrs. Brown doesn't realise she uses it. She uses the, 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 the F word as a mm-hmm. as like a hyphen or an apostrophe or an adjective. Yeah. Or whatever. She doesn't realise she's using it. And uh, there are a lot of people like that. Oh, like, yeah. Bad language, but she'd use some somewhere sometimes. Which she used to. She's got to mention now, so she doesn't really say anything. Oh, but she used to to like things that come out, and you just laugh. Yeah. And old people have this wonderful thing, especially older women. They can be outrageous. They can say anything, mm-hmm. and it's not. You know that there's no intention to offend or to upset. It's just what they say. And I just think oh, older women can do this type of thing. And Mrs. Brown sums up all those older women <laughs> that can just say it as they see it and don't realise what they're saying. And it's mm-hmm. bad. And there's no offence intended and there's no uh, intention to upset anybody or anything like that. No, no. I've got to say it was actually my mum because we missed the first ever show you did on TV. The, yeah. It's a Christmas one, isn't it? And no. we taped it. Or taped it. Sorry, we Skype or whatever it is. We, we put it on something to watch. And it was my mum who found it. Did you see that Mrs. Brown's Boys? We were like, no, why? And my mum, it's like my mum, you know, she was like, it was hilarious. I was like, she's like yeah. Hyacinth Bouquet. And really, they, she's like the prim- yeah, but they, Your mother, I never will, I will know somebody in her family mm-hmm. that was like Mrs. Brown or somebody on her street that's like Mrs. Brown. Oh, we yeah. get people, Brendan gets people coming up to him and they're, they're Mrs. Brown. And they say, Brendan, see that Mrs. Brown? I know a woman who's exactly like. And Brendan's like, you should look in the mirror yourself because you are Mrs. Brown. Nobody thinks they're Mrs. Brown, but there's millions of them. There's millions of them out there. <laughs> Definitely, I, I do know. I do know a granddad. <laughs> there's loads of them. Oh, yeah. And what's about what Brendan does? And I've said this a few times on things. There's sitcoms out there that I, I, I I'm a big fan of uh, British sitcoms and then British. Uh, television in general i'm not really that too gone on the american um some of them are good but i'm not too too gone on things like american shows um they're all right but some of the characters aren't believable the british ones i love and some british sitcoms are great and i loved faulty towers i absolutely adore it so i'm not slagging it off i love it (laughs) but basil had the same relationship with everybody all the other characters he was angry he had the same relation with polly as he had with manuel as he had with the wife as he had with the major, as he had with the other people, and he had with the people who were doing up the hotel. Well, anyone who came into the hotel, he had the exact same relationship yeah. with them. Mrs. Brown, the way Brendan writes, and that's where I think his genius is, Brendan writes, Mrs. Brown has a different relationship with every character there. Mm-hmm. She has a relationship with Winnie that she doesn't have with her children. She has a relationship with Kathy that she doesn't have with Rory. She has a relationship with Rory that she doesn't have with Kathy and... It's like or it's like if you've got brothers and sisters and um, we we'll say, God forbid, you're at a funeral, your mother's funeral or something mm-hmm. like that. Our auntie who's been at, who know, they will all have, a, have, have had, all the, you'll hear this, they will all have had different memories and different relationships with the mother. Yeah. And that's how Brendan writes Mrs. Brown. And that's where his genius is because I don't see that in other sitcoms. I love Absolutely Fabulous. Mm. Um, Edwina, she has the same relationship with everybody. Yeah. And I love it, but I, I, I'm not... I'm not no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I love Absolutely Fabulous, and I love Steptoe and Son, and I love um, a lot of these programmes, but the characters have the same relationship with everybody, no matter who comes into the show, whatever whatever guests they have, they have the exact same relationship with them all. Mm-hmm. And um, they're still funny. Faulty Towers, Absolutely Fabulous, they're amazing shows. Yeah. But Brendan writes differently to all of them. Brendan writes different. Mrs. Brown has a different relationship with everybody, which is like what most families have. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where people identify 
very closely with Mrs. Brown. And that's where the popularity stems from, apart from the comedy that Brendan brings into it. <laughs> but it stems from the relationship that yeah. Brendan is able to write for all those characters. And they're all, they all have different relationships with Mrs. Brown. It's fabulous. I just think it's amazing what he does. It is, it is very good. Like you say, it's, um, I've, I've got a sister and she loves it. And we go and we've got my wife and she watches it. And you're right, because we can all identify to different characters. Oh, so you'll identify with somebody. Yeah. <laughs> somebody that in there that you would say, that's the relationship that I, like you could say with Trevor or something, that's, re- that's the relationship I have with my mother. Or Rory, mm-hmm. that's the relationship I have with my mother. But they all, it won't be the same. You'll identify with one of the characters yeah. that's having a relationship with Mrs. Brown. And Brent, I don't know how he does it, but that's what he does. And it's absolutely brilliant what he does. And I love the fact that Mrs. Brown just accepts Rory and the whole family of the Browns, they accept Rory, he's gay, and they accept Dino, and it's never discussed. It's never like... um, Yeah, it's not. It's never made an issue. It's just... Mrs. Brown didn't understand it. She said to Dino, I don't understand it. I don't really understand the gay thing, but I understand happiness. And if you make my son happy, then I'm happy. And that's like what... that's every mother. That is every mother wants their child to be happy. And it's just brilliant stuff. Yeah. And um, So the whole Brown family, so we get charged, like uh, accused of being oh, homophobic. Mrs. Brown is the least homophobic character on television. Oh, Mrs. Brown, and all, the, all the Browns, they totally accept Rory and Dino. Mm-hmm. And it's not even a, a thing that comes up every week. Oh, this is me gay son. It's just, it's never brought up. They, no. we, they know I'm a gay character. Every the odd, I played the I played the stereotype of a gay character, and that's what they do. But Mrs. Brown loves me, loves loves Rory Brown, as she loves all her children, mm-hmm. and it's told and it's totally accepted, and it's just fabulous stuff. Mrs. Brown is the least homophobic character on television. She's fabulous. Oh yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. You can and you know you could you can always see it whenever there's an argument, whether you know Rory is on the stage and and coming, you know doing. The lab to be I'm going to come onto the corpse in, in a minute, but you know when they're talking, when there might be a serious yeah. moment and stuff like that, you know you can see that Brendan's always got the um, it's, it's the character of Mrs. Brown's always conflicts, and she's like, oh, you know, I really want him to be happy, just let yeah. it be, let it be, carry on, and you know yeah, she doesn't care. It. It's just, and it's Rory pure... comes in and he's having a row with Gino, and they're having a big kissy fish, and Mrs. Brown's going, Oh, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't get it, but she it's it's what they do, and that's all the thing, and anyone was to upset say anything about her son should come out swinging Mrs. Oh, I just think Brent, well, the way Brendan O'Carroll writes I just think it's fabulous I love it I love it <laughs> are all I, the hits to Dino scripted yeah. by the way <laughs> Cause was, when we, we always watched... know when she's hitting us with the tea towel mm. and Mrs. Brown and, and my mother you know all mothers loads of women used to go around and they'd have the tea towel and it was like a tool yeah. they would be careful they'd use it to open jars they'd use it to open doors they'd use it to <laughs> wipe down something they choose it to wash, wash dishes they choose it to hit the kids they always had this tea towel with them mm-hmm. um, my granny was the same she never went she well when she was in the house would pick up the tea towel and she'd walk around with it and it was like a tool she would open and jar. it was something she used all the time and Mrs. Brown is like that now we know when we're on stage that we're going to get hit with the tea towel yeah. we know it's coming but we don't know when it's coming <laughs> And that's what because if you know what's coming and you're on stage, yeah. you're up, like you're just immediately going to go like that. Yeah, and it, it ruins the moment really. Because they know, oh, he's here's he's expecting the tea towel, or else going, you're going sideways. So we never know what's coming. Just bang! And the, my mother used to be like that. She would, <laughs> and it would be, you would never like you, you wouldn't understand how it happened. But she get you <laughs> because you couldn't. Well, so when when I was growing up, you had to, if you were going to be bold, we had to pick where we were going to be bold. Yeah. If it was the fire, you would say, "Oh no," because my mother would hit you whatever was close to her hand. This mm. is we're going back to the sixties. Could be a poker or something. She would pick it up. <laughs> or if, <laughs> if it was at the table, she'd just throw something that you could be the salt cellar or whatever. <laughs> oh God, I should have rang Esther Ransom when I'm thinking about this. But if we're near. Where she was over at the the sink or the presses or something mm. like that. That's where it's just going to be a tea towel. You know, so that's grand. So if you're going to give back chat or cheek to your mother, you wouldn't do it. You'd have to pick where you're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you knew you were going to get hit, but you didn't know when. But you try and pick where you were going to where it was going to happen, so you know what the weapon would be, what the weapon of choice would be. I would even take her slipper off and fling it and everything. And I, God, if that was to happen now, Esther Ranson would have had us taken into care. Oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm not slagging off my mother. No, I am slagging off my mother, but she was a great mother. <laughs> all the time. 
Everybody was those days. It was. That's what happened back then. You know, that's yeah. never did never did any of us any harm, did it? So. <laughs> Twitching. <yeah. laughs> oh, you could run. I could always outrun my mother. <laughs> Yeah, I only mentioned it because I remember seeing it. Yeah, it's a few times. Obviously, see it all the time. But I think she got Gary right, well and good on the first game. So it was just like wallop, and it was oh, just yeah. that was it. It was just it was, the sound yeah. just echoed. And it was just like whoa, oh, that's unbelievable! <laughs> it's fabulous. And the kids, the question I am asked most, especially by kids who come to the show or something like that, is does the tea tail hurt? And you say it does hurt. <laughs> it's not hurt that should be injured hurt yeah it just stings it's a slight sting um and that's what it, that's what it is but again we never know what's going to happen and it's usually when she's behind you and you're just saying this bang you're... <laughs> 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 but that's what most others used to do most well, it was, yeah. take you by surprise <laughs> <laughs> that was it that was it <laughs> excellent i mean you you are well known and well loved as well for the for your perfect corpse in that you, you just can't keep a straight face and <laughs> you are a giggler you admit I'm that perfectly and i have when mrs brown goes off on one mm-hmm. brendan and brendan does this because we'll tour this play that we're doing now good morning mrs brown we did that in australia last year and we're doing it all through the uk this year and we finish up in dublin at christmas time yeah so but after four days you could you know your lines, you know when you're coming on stage, you could be standing outside talking to somebody, then you say, oh, hang on a minute, I just have to go on and do my bit. You walk on, walk, glide through your scene, and then know when you have to leave the stage. The only problem with that is the audience know you're not giving 100%, but you're doing everything right. You're hitting the mark you should be hitting, you're saying the lines you should be saying, but you're just not giving 100%. Like, it's not like a first night audience yeah. or a first night, the first night you're doing it when you're giving your, 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 your energy is really up. Um, so Brendan knows that. So he changes it every night. Every single night he will change it because his attitude is it might not be your first night to do the show, but it's this audience's first night to see it. Yeah. And you've got to give them 100% or more. You've got to really go for it every, every single night. And... Um, you could get complacent when you're playing to ten thousand people. The odd, the the, you could actually think, I'm a star. I can. They're going to love me. And mm-hmm. but to start doing that, yeah, you're not. You're taken away from the performance, and the audience will see through it like that. They will see through it immediately. And um, so Brendan changes it. So we're side stage saying, I wonder what he's going to do tonight. And you're like this, you're... Yeah, you're on edge, you're waiting. You're not, you're not, you're not relaxing. <laughs> backstage waiting to go on like you would be if you were busking it. You're, you're, you're raring to go. And when you get out on that stage, and Mrs. Brown, like she had me singing in a, in a play that has no sounds. And she <laughs> me questions that aren't in the script. Or she'll just start going off on one and start telling jokes and stuff mm-hmm. like this. And I have the best seat in the house when Mrs. Brown goes off on one because I'm sitting right beside her. And I can see the expressions on his face. <laughs> I can see the twinkle in his eye. Yep. I know what he's doing. And he knows he's trying to make me laugh. And then he won't stop. He'll keep going until mm. I'm in the heap laughing. And then he'll make it look like it's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> but he does this all the time just to keep this freshness in the show he mm-hmm. does that all the time and it comes from a stand-up background you can't relax mm-hmm. if you're a stand-up comedian you can't just busk it because you lose the audience like yeah. that mm-hmm. and brandon is listening to the audience and like when we film mrs brown for the christmas specials or something or the mm-hmm. mrs brown TV series we do always do it in front of a live audience and we will rehearse those shows to within an inch of their life yeah and we know exactly what we're supposed to do. If the reaction from the audience isn't as Brendan had hoped, he will change it on the spot. Mm-hmm. The only thing is we haven't a clue what he's doing and it's been filmed. Or it's a live show. When we went out on the live show, if you remember the live broadcast, um, we rehearsed that for two weeks. Yeah. And the one scene, all the other scenes I was in, there was, it didn't matter if I got the lines wrong because mm-hmm. there were only variations of Mammy, can we talk now? Or I could say, Mammy, is it okay to talk now? Or Mammy, can um, is this a good time to talk? Mm-hmm. Didn't matter what order I got them in. Yeah. And, and Mrs. Brown would say, live, Rory, live. And I'd just walk back out. <laughs> but there was one scene where there was myself, Dino, and Kathy. Mm-hmm. And all my lines had to be word perfect because 
if I would say something, it would then the next shot would be a reaction from Cathy, which had to be a certain reaction, or Gino yeah. give a response. So my lines had to be word perfect. I couldn't miss. I couldn't mess them up. Yeah. And we got to the end of it, and all I had to do was get out the door. Mm-hmm. And my last line, that Dino says, "Let's go back to the apartment and make up a plan." And we would run out the back door, and Mrs. Brown goes, "Rory, come back here." <laughs> <And> <laughs> This has been broadcast live on television as we're as we're doing it. It's been broadcast, mm-hmm. and I just looked and I went, "Oh no, please, no, 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 <laughs> no not, this is not a time to play. Please don't do this." And I'm petrified. My heart was in my mouth. And this is the one where he sat down and he said, "Sit down there, Rory." So I sat down and he said, "Have you ever seen Mrs. Murphy's pussy?" Okay. <laughs> I, I just went. I was gone. I was gone and I just started laughing and he kept going on and on and on and the more he went on the worse I got and I was following him. he's talking about this woman's cat that yeah. got lost that I couldn't get back into the house and blah 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 of course it makes me look like oh you're pervert whatever <laughs> you're dirty, whatever and then I just thought the only way I can get out of this is just to run out the door and I did I just jumped up and ran I didn't say goodbye I didn't say anything I just jumped up and ran and I thought okay Brandon you start this you could finish it, and he did. It was wonderful, but it was and it was a brilliant scene afterwards. Mm-hmm. When I saw it back, it was hilarious, but it was the most frightening thing <laughs> because it was live, and I knew there was yeah. about ten million people watching it live, and he just went completely off script. Come back! I was this far from the door. <laughs> I, I was nearly out. You I, nearly I, made it. I was nearly out. Come back! <laughs> and I was terrified because I just didn't know. But he wanted something. Mm-hmm. And whatever it was he wanted, he was happy that he got it. Yeah. And because um, the audience, the, the studio audience were screaming laughing. <laughs> and I'm thinking afterwards, if they're screaming laughing, the people at home are screaming laughing. Job done. Yeah. But it was terrifying. But that's what Brendan, <laughs> but he does that every night on stage. Every mm-hmm. night he will change things all over the place. In every scene, he will change things just to keep it fresh. So if you went to see our show in Manchester last week, if you went on on Wednesday night and went on Thursday night, you'd have seen two different shows. Yeah. You'd have got, the the storyline would have been the same start. There would have been something similar in the middle and something similar at the end. Mm-hmm. Everything in between them to get to them, totally different. Every night is different. Fantastic. That's what's fabulous about it. It is. It is. I do remember that live that live one. Sorry. Um, I'm giving you very long answers to these questions. Oh, this I? this is fine. It's brilliant. <laughs> this is what the show is about. It gets to know you more. But yeah, I remember that live show, and I think I woke my son. Uh-huh. I think we woke we woke my son up because we were creasing up with laughter, and the laughter was just was raucous because it was just. But, but he called me back and asked me, "Did I see Mrs. Whatever her name is, um, her her, her, pussy, her yeah. pussy?" That was not in the script, <laughs> and that was the first time I heard that, and I'm going, "Oh." Come on. <laughs> <laughs> And it's live in front of millions of people. And it's like, I don't know what to do here. I don't. So I'm laughing because mm. it's funny. And at the same time, I'm going, my mind is going, how am I going to get out of this? What am I going to do? How am I, I have to do something. What am I, so I, I, eventually I just, like the coward I am, I just jumped up and ran. <laughs> <laughs> you're on your own, man. Yeah. You're on your own, Mrs. Brown. I'm gone. Yeah. <laughs> Finish it off. <laughs> I do remember when we got the Good Morning, Mrs. Brown, we saw there was a couple of ones, I think, where you just said you've got your singing. Because I knew that he threw in the questions for you as well and he started to get, I can't remember what they were about. He was asking you to describe it. And he goes, go on, just like they used to do in your face. You just, that was you, you yeah. <laughs> again, that's, it was just that's like. <laughs> that's what he does. Or there's a thing when this scene where John, he did it with Gary one night and, uh, Gary comes in and goes, uh, I say, me and Dina were riding up in the park. We were out horse riding and Mrs. Brown, oh, you dirty swines and all this oh, type yeah. of thing. Dino comes in, he's bang, he's gone, me and Rory. And Mrs. Brown's supposed to go, yeah, we heard. But one night, Dina goes, me and Rory. Yeah, what happened? And Dina was totally stuck. <laughs> there's no lie. And he goes, me and Rory. Is there an echo in here? Yeah, what happened? And Dina, <laughs> and he's trying to make up stuff. <laughs> and he does this all the time. He asked you questions that aren't in the script. And as I said, he got me singing one time. And I was singing the big belter that Barbara Strides and sang in Hello, Dolly. <laughs> he's he, 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 like, he'd be sitting there waiting for for us to, to deliver a line. And next mm. thing he says, Rory, sing that song you used to sing that cheered me up when you were a babe, when you were a child. And I'm going, I beg your pardon. 
and he kept going and the audience are going come on Rory come on Rory and, they, and he wouldn't stop it and he just kept on and so I thought I better do something so I started going not that shite she said <laughs> sing the one from Hello Dolly and I went I think your part because <laughs> I can't sing oh what's that one Barbara Streisand sang wave your little hands and whisper so long and it's a big belter of a song that mm. Barbara Streisand can do but not <laughs> so I started to wave your little hands and whisper so long dearie I, and he said I oh, know Rory you have to do the actions <laughs> oh no <laughs> so I'm up and I'm giving it loads and the audience are clapping along and then he just says ah it was very cute when you were a child it looks shite now sit down and I'm going <laughs> I'm going to kill you <laughs> I'm going to kill you <laughs> But he does this all the time, and it's great fun. It mm -hmm. is. Afterwards, I roar laughing. I roar laughing. <laughs> but when, and but also when Mrs. Brown goes off on one, I've the best seat in the house. As I said, I'm there. I'm right in Mrs. Brown. I've the, mm -hmm. I'm right beside her. Yeah. And I just know there's divilment here, <laughs> and that's that's what it is. And it's fabulous. It's it is. It's brilliant. I love it. Part of the charm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I think it was the, one of the live shows about a year, two years ago. I think. I think Fiona got him back, and that was probably one of the best moments I'd seen because I think Fiona and it's uh, no, but she was sitting on the sofa, and obviously Brenda and Mrs. Brown was on the other side, and she was trying to get them and doing that, you know, she was just throwing them lines, oh. and and but then all of a sudden Fiona Carroll she came back with one as Maria, and she just I can't remember what she said, but the line just came back and totally that's, stumped that's Brenda. Those things, those <laughs> things are very few and far between, and nobody ever gets the best of Mrs. Brown because. <laughs> But if I, I remember that, and I can't remember what what the line was either, because we were all backstage going, "Yes, yes." <laughs> was something. But Brendan even started laughing himself. He Mrs. did. Brown started to laugh. He was gone. Yeah. Because it's just perfect. And then he just said, "He that was it." He just, he just went, said, "Touche, hey, touche." I remember it. I remember it well. I remember it. Touche. Yeah. And that's what it was because right, you've caught me, and that was it. But that very, very, very rarely happens. Very yeah, rarely. yeah. So I always see it the other way around. But that was the one time we were just we sat in the audience going, "Yes." It was very funny. got him back. Got him back. Never a while. But I remember that touche. I remember that. And then Mrs. Brown says. You'll be, you'll, and he did make her. You'll pay for that. And it, oh, he did, it, yeah. Well, another scene, he did. It was like, all right, so you want to play? Here we go. <laughs> and that was it. So I just, I not I don't do that. I just, I just laugh and go, all right, okay, here we go. Because I know, yeah, I, couldn't, I couldn't take Mrs. Brown on. I couldn't because <laughs> anyway, I wouldn't want. To. I just enjoy. I just have a, I have a great time. I mean, if I'm laughing, I've, and I have to say to myself, Rory, you're in the show. You're not at the show. Cut it out. Stop mm -hmm. doing this. But there you go. It's fabulous. I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change anything. I love it. Well, that's fair enough. That's that's perfect then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, you said earlier. I know I was a question, but it reminds me. You said earlier, obviously, that the, the people in the US don't know Mrs. Brown. They don't know it as widely, but you do have a lot of fans in the USA of we, Mrs. Brown I, as well. And they were just wondering whether you're actually thinking of doing anything I over there. Love the fans. Um, the, the, for some reason, I, I, I remember thinking, I remember hearing. I don't know how true it is, but I, from what I can gather. Um, all the, the the American soldiers that are on the bases, whether they're in Iraq or whatever they are, they all have the CD or the DVDs of Mrs. Brown, and they're watching them. And so they get so yeah. we're, we're huge with the troops. Um, we're huge with the troops. And then in Mrs. Brown is shown in Canada and um, BBC Worldwide. Yeah. So that goes into parts in North America as well. So there's loads of fans. There's loads of them. And mm -hmm. um, Brandon was offered ridiculous amounts of money to do Mrs. Brown like I the, the figure like over 40 million or something to record Mrs. Brown for America wow and he said no mm -hmm. the reason he didn't was he said it was um, they would want they wanted five series or something like that and maybe 15 or 16 episodes episodes a series right. and Brandon said I would be working all year just to do that yeah he is great he said but and he's dead right. We've been doing Mrs. Brown and we've been touring for 26, 27 years. And mm -hmm. before we were on television, we all had a good life. We had a great yeah. life. We were selling out theatres to like 1,500 and up to 3,000 seaters. We were selling them out for three weeks at a time mm -hmm. north and everywhere north of Birmingham. So we had a good life. Yeah. Um, to do that, it would be just be for money. But we've been working so hard, we wouldn't have had a chance to spend it. Mm hmm why would you and Brendan's attitude and it's a great attitude when you have the life you want the success you're having should buy you time not more money because you don't need more money I mean what are you going to do to buy a yacht 
but I'm going to be working so much. You know, yeah, you're not going to get it. Hmm? Here, how am I going to sell the bloody thing? Um, so, what's the point? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and what Brendan does, we have a great life, and Brendan does the, like every year, he, like over in Ireland, he would give like a quarter of a million at Christmas to the charity, local charity, uh, Vincent de Paul, yeah. which is a charity that helps poor family, people really in need. Mm-hmm. And he'll buy dinners for Christmas dinners for everybody that this organization yeah. said are really in in dire straits Mm -hmm. so they will have a Christmas so it's a Christmas dinner and all the trimmings and he will donate that and we will do we will do a gig in an arena that holds 10,000 and we'll do six nights and one of those nights the money will be split up between Chiline uh, an autism charity or whatever and um, he'll split them and that's another few hundred thousand and stuff so we that's what he really wants to do that more so than earn more money Mm -hmm. and work up into the ground like brandon is like brandon's been working in comedy since nine like 27 28 years yeah he has a brilliant life he has the life he wants he's living in florida he has a great time he has a lovely house over there and he comes back over and he loves touring he has the perfect life Mm -hmm. for him why would he want to be doing this amount of extra work for a tv series in america and then they own you and they and it's like yeah. the pressures that comes on that to try and write all that those amount of episodes and stuff mm-hmm. like that. if you see most other shows and you see writers there's loads of them yeah they've got there's, loads of yeah, loads and loads of them Brendan writes everything himself Brendan yeah. writes the whole lot and he writes it he directs it he does, he, Brendan does everything himself and to do all that it's just it's not the life that he wants he has the life he likes and we all have a great life mm-hmm. Mrs. Brown has given us and that old woman from Fingless, from that working class area in Fingless, has given all of us an amazing life, a, a brilliant life. We've lots of time off, and we've great fun when we're on the road, and we do the Christmas, the the Christmas things, and we're also doing all round to Mrs. Brown's. We have a yeah. great life. We don't need to do more, and to do more would just be greedy. And what's the point in doing that? You're drawing yourself into mm-hmm. a nearly grave. Yeah, I think that's another thing that endears you guys as you know as to the fans as well is because. You you do that. You're not greedy. You're not. You know. You've you no. do things for the love of doing it. I mean, the fact that you co- you come out ef- after every show as well, um, uh, and make we, sure every yeah. single person's met. You go. Mm. You know. I know in real, for example, there's people who can't make the front because they might be in chairs. You make sure you go over the barriers to make sure they get hello I mean, and a photo. You know, it's, it's things like that. Is just no amazing. No idea what kills us um, is um, people greedy swines that do. And I went to see a singer in the O2 in London last year. And I have a big fan of hers. I won't say who it is, mm-hmm. but a big fan of hers. And she was doing a few nights in the O2 in London. And she was charging people. Now, this has been split between her and the promoter. Yeah. 800 pounds for a meet and greet. 800 quid. Some of them charge more. Some of them charge less. There's so many people they charge. They charge fans. Mm-hmm. I hate that. If you're selling out the O2 or you're selling out an arena, you're making money. Yeah. How much money do you need to get? <laughs> How much money... Two kids in school, if they go and see somebody mm-hmm. and one father organises a backstage, a VIP uh, package yeah. and his daughter goes and sees this artist and has a photograph taken or whatever as a mm-hmm. meet and greet and the other girl's father can't afford two kids at the same concert from the same school in the same class, they both have a different experience. Yeah. Because one, I think, I hate it, it's greed. Anybody, and I would say to anyone out there, don't buy any VIP packages. They're not worth it for a start. Mm. Um, and it's only feeding the greed of the artist that's doing it. You, Any artist that does that, and you're a greedy bastard. Uh, that's all I can say to you. You are vile. You are a horrible <laughs> person. You are a horrible group of people to do that. We do not charge to meet anybody. We wouldn't do it. We would yeah. never do it. We go out and meet if, if people are there. And sometimes it could take us hours to get through them because <laughs> there could be hundreds of people. We will talk to everybody. We will sign everything. We will have photographs taken with everybody. And we'll do it. I mean, the people, if we're signing stuff, that means they bought a program or they bought a T-shirt or they bought a hat or they bought yeah. some sign. They've also bought a ticket. They've spent money. Mm-hmm. How much more money do we need? <laughs> <laughs> I just, there, this is happening in, and lately, and I see it all over the place, and it's just, it really turns me off, people, when I yeah. see VCP packages. Yeah. Oh, wait, you greedy swines. You are robbing people. It's not right. Yeah. You do 
not do that. Mm-hmm. The other thing I hate is the 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 the, the ticket sites where secondary ticket agents and they're they're buying up tickets at the beginning and then they sell them at way over the odds. I know there's a lady in real she ended up getting ripped because of that. Never pay. Never pay. Leave them stuck with it. Never ever pay more than the odds. And people come to our shows and we're going, please don't do that. Yeah. And they say, oh we've paid a thousand pounds for three tickets or four tickets and we're going you're not a fan if you do that. No, hang on a minute. I've just seen that this is going to run out soon and I have my charger here. Okay. <laughs> Don't mind. Oh, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. I'll have to put this back in. Perfect. Cool. Perfect. That's grand. So, I'm oh, sorry about that. That's just right. it's live. <laughs> but no, we never charge to meet people and uh, we always say to people, never pay over the odds for our tickets. Our ticket price is our ticket price and don't pay any more than that for it. Mm-hmm. No, somebody else. Uh, don't buy into somebody else's greed and and give them money or any organisation. Don't do it. Yeah. And, and the artists who do it, you're greedy swines. I can't stand. <laughs> it. I hate you. <laughs> There's a big but, thing about that. I'm like her now. I'm, I'm hating people. Who just, <laughs> no, I think it's a rip off. It's not right. It's not right to treat fans like that. No, I'm no. Really- <laughs> I go I go to Comic Cons a lot, and I know there's a lot of queries about that because if I go to a Comic Con, you have to save up because you're paying twenty, thirty pounds for an autograph there at a Comic Con, and the one there's one in London where a photo shoot with some of the it can be. I mean, I, we had tickets to Star Wars Celebration last year. You know, the big one in London. There was a, yeah. the big one in London. I, it cost me 180 quid for the tickets just to go for the three of us and we ha- I had to lose the money because the hotel obviously would have been at three or four hundred pound for the weekend and yeah. but I found out shortly before that a certain Jedi Knight who <laughs> for example well, I'm not, I'll say the names it's fine Mark Hamill for example he was 150 pounds for an autograph Carrie Fisher was a hundred at the time, bless her, you know, God rest her soul, you know, she was there. Um, but, it didn't do her much good, did it? I mean, <laughs> but you're right. But they, I, we couldn't go. I lost nearly two hundred pounds in tickets because I said we can't afford to yeah. go and meet anyone. <laughs> so you can't have the same experience that everybody else is who has the money. It's it's yep. disgusting. It is mm-hmm. disgusting yep. to charge fans extra. Charge the ticket price. And that's it. Mm-hmm. And sell merchandise. And if they want to buy stuff, that's great. And if they want a, a memento and they buy a program or a T-shirt or a cap or whatever, that's fine. And then you sign it if yeah. they want it signed. You don't charge to meet them. You don't charge to sign stuff. Yeah. You don't charge for photographs. Yeah. That's greed and it's disgusting greed. Oh, it's, yeah. it's horrible. <laughs> I, I really, I, there's nothing good about that. That's just greed. That is greed. <laughs> Well, that, this one will wind you up because the other thing at Comic Cons, which is a new thing, which which annoys people, is they're charging for selfies now as well. Some of them. Disgusting. So char- some of them put it to charity, which is fine because if they don't. To char- care. But even so, this. But the, um, for example, Mick, a wrestler, <laughs> I was going to say, a wrestler at the last Comic Con I went, he was forty pounds for a signature or no. forty pounds to have a selfie. So you're paying forty quid just to use your own phone to have a picture with him. Or oh sorry, thirty pound for an autograph, thirty pound for a selfie, or forty pounds for the two together. Um, but a lot of them charge five or ten pound for a selfie, and you know, and there's some of them. If you take a picture of them in the queue, there's one, and I've I'll forever know. I'm not going to name her on on this because people go, she's a cantankerous old cow. I'll tell you after if I can remember her name. But she actually, I was in the queue to get an autograph, and she physically looked at me and she went, she cowled over and turned her face away and turned her back on me. And then got me told off by the person who was aiding her for trying to take a photo of her while I was standing in the queue waiting to meet her. <laughs> I tell you, I, oh, I, I can't stand that. There is no need for that. And for, the, for her to do that, I mean, she's a cow. Whoever she is, that is just... Oh, do you see, it makes, greed makes people ugly. Yeah. And that's what they, they become. They become ugly people. Mm-hmm. They become ugly inside, ugly out. They just become ugly people. And yeah. they think they're entitled to that. And it's just, it's, I hate it. I think anybody who does it is vile. They are vile, horrible people. They're vile. And there's no excuse for it. And I know the promoters might be selling it. Well, this is a good idea to do this. Mm-hmm. Don't fall for it if you're not. Don't fall for it. It's, you're just a greedy, horrible swine if you do that. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> well, <just say>. <laughs> that, that really is it. That really just gets me going. I hate, I can't stand that. I can't stand it. Here's me saying, oh, it's only a television show. You shouldn't hate things like that. But I don't like greed. Greed is not a good thing to have. It's not, it's not. You're right. And I mean, some of these people, you know, they're earning millions on, 
Hollywood yeah. anyway, so why? Can you? You're making money. I don't care what anybody says. If you're selling <laughs> out an arena or you're just arriving to at a, an exhibition or something like that, you're being paid to do that. You're making money. Mm-hmm. You don't have to rip off the fans anymore. You don't have to do that. You can do it, but you just... Oh, yeah. It's fine. If you clean inside, you're ugly out and you just made yourself horrible to do that. It's dreadful. I hate I can't stand it. <laughs> yep, I think that's clear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. I've actually got one question from someone in Canada before I move on to that queer, that, that, that funny question that I was going to mention to you before. Is there... Uh, this is from a uh, chap called Simon Barry Brisbane, who's a listener of mine. And okay. he says, in Canada, there is actually a French-Canadian remake of Mrs. Brown, retitled as Madame Le Brun. It's quite popular with the public. Do you know yeah. of it? Have, um, and have you seen it or any other international remakes? There's one in Romania called Tanti Florica. Mm-hmm. And um, Brendan sells the, and the BBC. They will sell the rights to show... to different i don't know all the territories that yeah. they sell but they have to do use the the same characters and it's basically just a direct translation of what happens the set even has to look i saw tanti florica and it's, i swear it's like looking at mrs brown's set in the bbc in glasgow it's the mm. exact same um but the character who was playing rory he looked like a little bovril bottle now i mean this, <laughs> <laughs> how do they think that looks like me but and in Russia, right, what I loved, Brand, I just loved Brendan Forrest. Mm-hmm. Um, Russian TV, some TV station in Russia wanted to buy the format of Mrs. Brown to show over there. Yeah. And they said they didn't want the gay character. Now, it was the same with Romania. They didn't want the gay characters in it. Mm. And Brendan insisted they kept them. And uh, they were saying, well, no, a gay character in Romania uh, would be thrown out. He wouldn't be living at home with his mother. If he was gay, he was openly gay, he would be thrown out. Yeah. And Brendan said, keep the gay characters and he said it to Russia and Russia didn't buy it and Brendan wouldn't sell it to them because they didn't want Rory and Dino mm-hmm. and Brendan said under no circumstances and I just loved Brendan O'Carroll for that I just thought well yeah. fair play to you again he could have said oh, give me the money do what you like which is <laughs> well, yeah exactly but no he wanted to keep it faithful he yeah. wouldn't do it and um, that's that's what happened and Russian the Russian television don't have it and fine that's 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 brendan doesn't care brendan couldn't care less <laughs> um, they wanted to mess with the format and he wasn't having it and yeah. they wanted to remove characters and he just said no and they, they wanted to remove characters just because they were gay characters yeah exactly now that's disgusting as well yeah and brendan, straight away he didn't even think about it just said no mm-hmm. you get it you have to broadcast it exactly as we have it here as a like a direct translation or as close as you can yeah. be mm-hmm. Um, but you keep those characters. You keep Rory and Dino, and they 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 couldn't do it um, because whatever way the laws are going in Russia now and stuff like that, you couldn't, you can't do that. No, and no, Brent, it's stupid out there, you isn't don't, it? You don't, the, you don't show the, you don't have the series, and I was so proud of him for doing that. It was yeah. fabulous. I didn't know that. That's actually something which is oh, yeah. something to be really proud of. Well, as well. I know there's Tanti Florica, and as you say, that one in Canada, and there's there's others in some other in some other countries as well. Um, and they will sell the to the the non these non speaking territories. Yeah. And they sell the format, but mm-hmm. you've got to just translate it, and you've got to have it as close as possible. And Mrs. Brown probably has to be a man. Yeah. Um, they don't med like Brendan will not. Brendan can keep control of everything. We do everything in house, but Brandon keeps control of all his rights and stuff like that, and he doesn't let people do what they like with what he's created. Mm. So it's it's fabulous. I, I must have a look at um, what's it called again, the Mrs. Ma- Brown one. Uh, Madame Le Brun. <laughs> Apparently, Madame, Madame Le, Le Brun. Brun. I'm gonna yeah. look at that. I can, I've, I've got you, you sent me a YouTube link, so I'll, I'll send that over to you. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll have a look at that. So. <laughs> I've not no, looked. I've not seen it myself yet. This is what Rory looks like. <laughs> I'm one a... in Rico was a little Barbara bottle. <laughs> he, he curly hair and everything. And I'm going. He looks more like Russell Grant than he does. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fabulous. And the 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 one playing Mrs. Brown was a very famous actor in Romania. Mm. We didn't even try to sound feminine, but it was very, very <laughs> funny. And I knew because I knew exactly what they were, the scenes they were doing. Mm. And the one I saw was where Rory was trying to, Mammy, I, I want to come out of the closet. And I said, well, you have to wait till Buster comes <laughs> yeah. out before, before you can go in. I want to come in. I want to come out of the closet, whatever it was. We'll have to wait till Buster comes out before you can go in, all this type of stuff. Yeah. And I could see them doing it. And I, they were speaking in Romanian and I knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> 
So I'm glad we see the French one. <laughs> Brilliant. Excuse me. Okay, so this is the question. Um, okay. I, I started. This was asked to me because I had a gentleman on my show called Mike Quinn. He played 99 Numb in Star Wars. He's also been a mu- Muppeteer with Jim Henson for like 25 years. Yeah, and the question came up of this, and I thought, you know what? This is a brilliant question to ask everybody. Oh. <laughs> so, if you were to have a Muppet made of you, what kind of Muppet would you be, and why? Um, well, I wouldn't be Animal. Um, I wouldn't be Miss Piggy. Um, the type of Muppet that I would like, um, it would have to be something uh, with loads of feathers. There'd have to be loads. There'd, there'd have to be like lots of swish when you when the, the thing would be turning around. Like whatever you see on the Muppets, um, the swishiest of them all would have to be more. Big bird. for roar. <laughs> so it would, no, it would have to be more than yeah. that. It'd really, have to be more than that. And uh, he'd have to be uh, a big yellow character. Mm-hmm. The big yellow. I think yellow and then probably like a bird or something like that it'd be yellow and you'd loads of other colours around the neck and stuff like that and that's the type of character something loud outrageous but with a heart of gold because um, that's what Rory Brown is like mm-hmm. Rory I, people always confuse they think I'm Rory Brown and my name is Rory um, but I'm not as nice as Rory Brown <laughs> Rory Cowan is not nearly as nice as Rory Rory Brown is a lovely character he's lovely and uh, <laughs> so the Muppet character like that would have to be something tall mm-hmm. and colourful and fluffy and um, just take over. He'd all he'd have to do is just walk in. Like, he would be the one that would see and steal from Miss Piggy, yeah. which nobody mm-hmm. else could do. But <laughs> my character in the Muppets would do that. Oh, yeah. Well, that's- <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I disagree, by the way, because I think you are um, just as good and nice as Rory Brown himself. Obviously, I don't know from talking to you for the past hour. So. I don't do any harm to anybody, and I don't. I like. I'm, but I just think Rory Brown is lovely. He really, <laughs> Rory Brown is just fabulous. Through and through, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I'm not. Some people will tell you, like some fan. Like I mean, I can be. I like. I'm. I'm okay with fans, but it depends sometimes on the day or how they react. Mm-hmm. Uh, like there's people that if I'm sitting in a restaurant and I'm eating and I'm with friends and somebody comes over and sits down, mm-hmm. just sits down at the table, you'd want to see when I kick it. You want to see that they're made under no illusions. They're not welcome and they better move. Yeah. Rory Brown would be like that. <laughs> uh, it's like if people have manners. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, like. We go out and we visit every most people are most people are lovely, but there's always one or two who are just you're gone, you're a horrible creature. And I don't give them the time of day. Mm. I know Brendan and Jenny and I'll say, Rory, you've got to just calm it down. I can't. <laughs> so it depends on the humour. I remember reading something about Boy George and he said and I love Boy George and he said, Well but, but some people it depends on like I, I used to worry about it, I used to regret some of the things I said, but he says it just sometimes you're in good humour, sometimes you're in bad humour or whatever. Yeah. I'm okay with fans as long as they're not but people if they if I'm in a supermarket or something and start shouting, I'm going, Would you calm down? No, just stay whatever. <laughs> I like <clears throat> it's it's hard to explain. Rory Brown would be much nicer. Yeah. Would be a much nicer person. I'd be more flawed than Rory Brown. My real <laughs> life would not be like I wouldn't want to be like Rory Brown, but there you go. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And in in final, I'm sure you're quite happy to okay. to, to finally think. Thank God for that. <laughs> it's uh, anything you'd like to say to the fans. I know you're obviously you're in regular contact with them via Twitter, Facebook, and the dragonflies and the brown owls have all said hello. <laughs> oh, that's no, I get on. i i the one. The, all the fan sites I like are the ones that I don't like. There's 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 there are fan sites that I don't like, and they're the ones that sell inferior. They're pushing inferior, Mrs. Brown. T-shirts, hoodies, mm-hmm. cups. We've even had beer label or beer bottle labels and some Mr. Brown beer bottle label. Those, those, the, what they're selling is tat, and they're like, as I say, where I was saying, people ripping off the fans. They're yeah. ripping off the fans. I don't like them. Mm-hmm. I have no time for those sites at all, and I hate seeing fans being cheated like that. But the the fan pages that we have, and the Rory Cowan, Rory Brown fan page, and the Mrs. Brown's Boys UK fan club. They're great because mm-hmm. they 
they're wonderful. They're, there's no side to them. They will just do, they're there to, people can get in contact with us and we'll get in contact back. But there are some fan sites out there that I just don't like and yeah. no time for them at all because they are ripping off the fans. They're cheating the fans in so much that the fans think what they're buying is official merchandise and it's of a certain quality and it's not. I know by looking at it, it's just they're being ripped off. Yeah. Somebody's making money out of these people and I don't like I don't like that type of greed. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the fan clubs that I don't like is the Mrs. Brown's Boys News because they do that and I right. don't like that. I don't like that at all. But the other fan sites, um, the, the, especially the official fan clubs, um, Rory Cowan, Rory Brown fan page that's run by Karen Story, and she also yeah. runs the Mr. Brown's Boys UK fan club. And then we all have our own Twitter accounts anyway. And so I like to keep in touch with the fans. I really do like to keep in touch with them because um, it's fabulous. Like I'm in a business where I never had any ambitions to be an actor. Mm-hmm. But... Um, it's it's the weirdest thing. I want like now that I am and I'm doing it. I I just try to imagine if I was on stage and there was nobody there and there was nobody coming and there was nobody following me on Twitter or something like that. I prefer it the way it is. I have <laughs> much prefer having thousands of followers on Twitter. <laughs> I love that. So I try and give them something every day and I record videos and I do all this and I try to mix it up and just to give something. Like last Christmas, <clears throat> I also sent out through the Rory Cowan, Rory Brown fan page, Karen got in touch with everybody and said, if you want a uh, photograph, a signed photograph. Um, so I paid for yeah. a few thousand other photographs. I signed them all individually too. If there was somebody, Caroline, to Caroline, happy mm-hmm. Christmas, lots of love, Rory Cowan. And I signed hundreds of the things. And I paid for the envelopes, I paid for the stamps, I sent them out. Yeah. What a charge for that. And I, people would have bought them, but why would I... You know, it's, why would they do that? They support. They're coming to the shows. They're they're nice to me on Twitter. They're so they're following me on Twitter, and it's just it's a photograph, and mm-hmm. I can sign. Now it took a few days to sign them all and whatever like that, but I enjoy doing it and I like it. Um, I'm at an age in my life where I appreciate it. Yeah, I know it's not a normal life. I know the success we have is not normal. Um, like I would say, if I'd have been 19 or 20, like somebody in a boy band, and I was. Um, we got this level of success yeah. and then you realize 24 it's gone mm. and this will be somebody else's turn in the wild you know what I mean Mrs. Brown can't keep going on forever there's yeah. going to be eventually it's going to end and somebody else somebody else's turn and good luck to them they, they, I hope they enjoy it like I'm enjoying it <laughs> but if I was 19 or 20 I might think it was normal and then 24, 25 you realize and it has been it's all gone blah 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 mm-hmm. so we've worked at, I'm at a time in my life where I can appreciate it so yeah I do appreciate the fans and um, because I know that they will probably move on to somebody else or some of them will stay, some of them will go. But I appreciate it while it's happening. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful and it's lovely and I adore it. Um, but I just, I, I'm also old enough and wise enough and been around the block a few times to realize this is not normal and this is not going to go on at this level for so long. But while it's going on, I'm enjoying it. I'm having a great time. <laughs> It's, it's, it's hard work but I love it and while it's gone I'm going to enjoy every single minute of it. I'm building up some fabulous memories for when I'm <laughs> old and dodgy <laughs> thank you Rory that was absolutely fantastic I'm sure you all could have seen the tears of laughter in my eyes I hope everybody enjoyed listening to that as much as I enjoyed listening to Rory talking and talking absolutely brilliant guy so much fun and such a really really genuinely nice person as well Hope to be able to talk to the rest of the cast and bring them to you too. So we shall keep, we shall see, and keep watching this space. This has been Chris Gordon on Hellblazer Beers, part of the BSPN Podcast Network, saying good night.